Greetings, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, so tonight I'm going to talk about the science of dog training. I actually changed the title a little bit. And through my talk, I'll explain why I changed the title of my talk. So uh, the uh, subheading, the science of dog training, I'm taking an evolutionary biology approach and looking at research applications that fit for dog training. So, introduction. So first of all, who am I? <laughs> so my name is Catherine Gavista, and I bet, like most people here, lifelong advocate, fan, love of dogs, right? But so I also took it a step further, and I just basically put my whole life into animals. So I'm an evolutionary biologist, I'm a zoologist, when I was an undergrad in college, I started working at Brookfield Children's Zoo for my summer uh, jobs, and I was chosen to be part of the dog training program. And I'll just tell you, I mean, I, that was the job of a dream. And I just loved every minute of being there. And so that's when I started training. I was 19 when I started training dogs. And I was also in the bird program, so I learned how to, um, train parrots and I did falconry kind of stuff. I'm an adjunct biology professor, which is why I sometimes go by Dr. K. Uh, I teach at a variety of classes, or I used to, now I'm just doing an online course. And I'm a professional dog trainer now and instructor. I have Lucky Dog Training Asheville. My training, pr my training approach and my blog is called The Dog's Perspective, and I'm going to explain that later on. Uh, I'm a consummate student of biology. I just always am learning. I love learning about dogs and just biology in general. And fit with Fido, it's just kind of a personal thing, but my dogs have kept me in shape for my entire life, and I just think they're the greatest thing, and if people want to do that, I really want to encourage them. Okay, so this is a summary of what I'm going to talk about tonight the science of dog training. I'm going to define science. I'm going to talk about science research that involves dogs and wolves, which then is going to be applied to dog training. And then I'll have some concluding remarks. So my first objective is to define science. And so science is the systematic approach to understand and describe our natural world. When you go outside, you know, there are the trees, they're green, you know, everything that you see out there. Science is just our interpretation in words, what we see out in nature. Most of the time, though, it involves both observations and experimentation. So there are three divisions of science, natural sciences, social sciences, and formal sciences. Formal sciences are basically mathematical models. That really doesn't have anything to do with dog training that I'm aware of, so I don't really focus on that at all, also because I don't really understand that stuff very well. <laughs> but the natural sciences and social sciences, I certainly do. The natural sciences are the study of the natural world. Social sciences are all about people and societies. Both of these fields, these divisions, collect empirical data. However, how they analyze the data is different. Natural sciences are objective, social sciences are subjective, and a really good way to explain how this is different with the Olympics coming up and two different types of events. You have the skiers, the downhill skiers, and then you have the ice skaters downhill skiers who has the fastest time is the winner. There's absolutely no subjective analysis in that. And so that's where the objective just cut to the chase kind of answer. Whereas when you see those ice skaters and there are judges and there's this subjective, oh, I liked how she, I don't know if they point their toes or anything, but there's this subjective nature to it. And that is also part of the social sciences because that has to do with people. OK, so my next point, my next objective is, what is the dog-wolf science research that would be applied to dog training? Okay. 
And so in the natural sciences, you have the big hitters, biology, chemistry, physics, and then in the social sciences, psychology. If you'll notice, archaeology and anthropology are kind of uh, cross-disciplinary, both natural and social sciences. But in the case of dog training, uh, it's more of the natural sciences. So we're going to look at archaeology, which is related to geology. And then biology, things like evolutionary biology, that's where biological anthropology is. Anatomy and physiology, hormones and behavior, neurobiology, veterinary medicine, and nutrition, all of these involve dogs and can be applied to dog training in different ways. Uh, and then when you're looking at the rest of the natural sciences, chemistry, particularly biochemistry, and when you're talking about medicine, nutrition, uh, holistic, pharmaceuticals, things like that. However, one of the things that we have to remember is that dogs are all sense of smell, and that's also chemistry, and that's something that we as humans really don't understand as well. And then physics, the actual mechanics of the dogs themselves, how they move, and the training equipment and how it affects them. Okay, and then the social sciences, uh, just psychology. So we're going to start there with psychology. And when you're talking about psychology, you're mostly talking about learning behavior in relation to dog training. But before we get to that, I just want to explain a little bit about uh, how Freud's work uh, uh, influences how you should look at dogs. So he uh, came up with this idea, these three different distinct parts of the human personality or the human psyche divided into the uh, id, ego, and superego. And these develop over a person's life. Okay? The id is the primitive instinct, sexual and aggressive drives. That's where you find dogs and children, okay? In the id, the very primitive, I want, I want, I want, I want, and that's all they do, okay? The ego and superego, now that's where we're coming from, the trainers, but we gotta understand that dogs don't think that way. And so that's a really important point. So I'm gonna show you um, these things right here, uh, pertaining to the id, ego, and superego, always remembering that the dogs are only in that category. So when you're thinking about how dogs think, um, I don't have my glasses on, I'm sorry, that's hard to see, but you're basically on instincts, things that are unconscious, entirely unconscious, and primal desires, what they need, what they want. And one of the things uh, we'll be looking at is what's called the pleasure principle. Anything that has to do with rational thinking, knowing the difference between right and wrong, any logical thinking, dogs don't do. That is not part of their way of thinking. We may think they do, or we may want to think they do, or want them to do it, but they don't think that way. And we have to understand that. That's really important when we're looking at those beautiful dogs. <laughs> so the pleasure principle, also called the pleasure pain principle, totally based on behavioral instincts, seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, wanting just these basic biological and psychological needs. As opposed to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the pleasure principle, it's the driving force of the id primitive, animalistic, instinctual, deep level of unconscious, dogs are in this category all the time. Uh, immediate pleasure and gratification, they will eat or drink anything and then ask questions, you know? I mean, it's just, I want, I want, give that to me, I want it instead, okay? Luckily, oops, I keep going too fast. Luckily, children grow out of that, and then they become part of the, um, I missed, sorry, I missed my slide. Oops. The um, reality principle. It, it's the counterpart of the pleasure, pleasure principle, and this is 
basically the ego and the super ego as people get older, as kids grow up, they start mediating, you know, like, okay, I want, I want, I want, but I can't have everything, you know, I have to be realistic about this. But dogs never change that. So if you remember, if you had had toddlers or you have grandchildren or you're just aware of toddlers, that, and when they want something, they don't go, please, mom, may I have that? They go, bah, you know, and that's what dogs do too, in a way. So they're forever toddlers and they never grow out of that pleasure principle. So having manners and stuff like that, we definitely have to teach them that. Okay, so forever toddlers, pleasure principle, and focus on the id. So you have to keep that in mind when you're thinking about dogs and how you're going to communicate with them. Okay, and then finishing up psychology, the big thing is learning theory. And if you've ever read anything about dog training, learning theory, B.F. Skinner, Pavlov, that's typically what they talk about. Learning theory, it, it describes how knowledge is absorbed, processed, and retained during learning. So how actual learning occurs. And there are different types of learning theories, and there are two of them that relate to dog training. One is that classical conditioning, that's Pavlov, and most people are familiar with this. Let me give you, that's Pavlov and his dog. But so what happens, you have a dog, and if they see food, they most likely will salivate. They want the food, okay? That's just a natural thing that happens. If they hear a bell, a dog isn't going to salivate. That's not something that they do. However, what you can do is that you can condition the dog. You can ring a bell, give them food, and they will salivate. And over time, if you take the food away and ring the bell, they'll anticipate the food and they'll salivate. And that's what classical conditioning is all about. So you use this thing to, uh, you use something like a bell or clicker training or things like that, and it, over time, they can anticipate some reward or whatever it is that you're going to do. Okay, classical conditioning is not rare. Okay, it happens all the time and dogs can get desirable or undesirable behaviors. So they're conditioned by certain cues. They see a leash, oh, we're gonna go for a walk. Or they hear a car, it might be mom and dad coming home. They hear their food bowl, oh, it's gonna be food. You know, They smell po uh, potty smells and it'll make them go potty. And this is one of the reasons why if they ever have an accident, you have to clean it up really well or they're gonna keep smelling it and say, oh, I can go potty right here, because that's what it smells like. They see other dogs barking, okay? That's not desirable, right? But so there are certain things that will cue them. And it's not just limited to dogs. We are also very conditioned. We're undergoing that all the time. We hear thunder. We anticipate that it's gonna rain, okay? Or we hear scary music, either the slasher or Jaws, and we're like, uh-oh, something kind of scary is going to happen. Somebody knocks on your door or rings the doorbell, you don't go, oh my gosh, what is that? You know, you're like, oh, someone might be at the door. You know, so you're already conditioned to those things. And dogs will condition us. Okay? If you've ever seen your dog sit by the door, do you have to go out? And then they'll teach you, yes, this is what I want. Or they actually bring you your leash, please may I go for a walk, or they give you those big puppy eyes and, oh, do you want attention or whatever it is. But so they condition us just like we condition them. Okay, so that's pretty easy stuff. Then there's B.F. Skinner's operant conditioning, okay, and this is a different type of learning uh, theory. I'm just briefly going to talk about this. My talk isn't really based on this very much. So I just want to give you a summary. So he had a Skinner box. He used two types of subjects, rats and pigeons. He didn't use dogs. Two types of stimuli, either food, great stuff, or electric shock, so nothing in between. And then two types of consequences, reinforcements and punishments. Okay, and this is what the Skinner box looks like. And there's the little mouse, and he either gets food or an electric shock depending on what they're doing. And so this is a 
a way that I explain operant conditioning. If you look up at the orange, these are good behaviors, desirable behaviors that you would really like to encourage in your dog. You know, they're uh, going potty where they need to, they're walking with you. These things are the things that you really want. Yes, these are great. The ones down here are the things that are not good. They kind of make you blue. That's why I put it as blue. It's like, no, you want to get rid of those, right? And so the terminology that Skinner used was that anything that you want, like what they're doing, we call that reinforcement. We're going to encourage it somehow. And then anytime they're doing something that we don't like, it's punishment, OK? And unfortunately, that word has really stuck in the dog training world. And I just want to tell you, I never, ever, ever use that word because I don't ever, ever punish. However, that doesn't mean that corrections or redirections are necessary. And I'm going to explain that. But I never use that word punishment. It's just up there because that's what Skinner uses. Now, the biggest confusion, though, that I find is when people are talking about this positive or negative. So you can have positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. Positive punishment or negative punishment. And all the positive or negative means is, say you want to encourage a behavior. You either add something, like food or whatever, to encourage that behavior, or you take something away to encourage that behavior. And actually, you know, like shock collars and things like that. But if you think about it, if you're using particular types of hand signals and you, they're doing something right and then you take it away, that is also a type of reinforcement. You're just taking it away. So the positive doesn't mean it's good and the negative doesn't mean you're hurting the animal, right? The same with these punishments. Positive punishment, you're adding something to punish or redirect or correct. And negative is that you're taking something away, okay? And I'll explain that a little bit more uh, later on. But so we got through that because I do, I know that a lot of people when they're reading about dog training and they get to operant conditioning, the eyes roll back and, you know, it's kind of boring stuff. But anyway, there's more stuff to dog training than psychology and operant conditioning. So what we're going to start with is uh, biology dog and wolf research. And first off, archaeology and biological anthropology. So archaeology. This was the, this is where we see in the geologic record the origin of the human-dog partnership. And dogs evolved from wolves and they separated from wolves. They had a common ancestor. And it was about 150,000 years ago. We don't know how many times it happened, maybe once, maybe multiple times. We don't know that. Uh, we're not certain. That's always under debate. But we do know it's about 150,000 years ago that wolves and uh, dogs separated. Now, fast forward, but not too far, to 35,000 years ago. And that's when you had Homo sapiens, who are with us, and Neanderthals. And they were contemporaries. They lived at the same time. And what happened? is that Homo sapiens, humans, dogs hung out with humans. Homo sapi uh, dogs did not hang out with Neanderthals. And there is a belief that dogs were a source of success for humans. And that was the advantage that they were able to outcompete uh, Neanderthals. I used to think that was like my idea, but I've learned over time that there are multiple references of people that they say, Dogs make us human. And I think you mentioned you had that one book but that I was talking about, Paxton, where dogs are responsible in part for the evolutionary success of, of Homo sapiens. Okay, so when did they, when some uh, really good evidence of dogs and humans actually hanging out together? And the earliest discovery they have, 15,000 years ago, a human dog grave. And so they were actually buried together. And that was an indication of domestication. Okay? So 150 years ago, uh, 150,000 years ago, dogs and wolves separated. 
35,000 years ago, dogs were already hanging out with humans, and then 15,000 years ago, dogs were probably domesticated. And if you didn't know this, dogs are the very first species that humans domesticated. They are the first. They are the prototype. They are the model upon which all other um, domestications are based. So domestication, that's all agriculture. So we owe all of what we know about agriculture originally to our domestication of dogs. It's pretty fascinating how much dogs have been part of our lives. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to talk a little bit about wolf research, our, uh, the dog's uh, most uh, closest relatives. And there was a book called The Wolf, published by David Meech, 1970. And this was the Bible of wolf biology. I, mean, I remember hearing about this. And what they found, what this book reports, is that wolves are pack animals. They live in packs. They hunt in packs. They have a very complex social, social hierarchy. The alpha males, the alpha females, the beta males, the omega males, constant uh, competition, who's, you know, their status, who's going to be top dog, so on and so on. Well, it turns out that these were all artifacts of captive research, okay? So this, they didn't ever study wolves in natural conditions until the wolves were released in Yellowstone in 1995. They did find that uh, wolves do hunt in packs, but they don't live in this hierarchy groups. They live with in, uh, breeding pairs, mom, dad, and the kids, just like humans, you know, essentially. So mom, dad, and the offspring, no alpha male ruling the pack, and actually they have now discovered that it's the females that are the top dogs. They're matrilineal societies, so it's the females are on top. And this was published in 1999 in the Canadian Journal of Zoology. So the wolves in Yellowstone, they were at really high densities. They did hunt in packs, but lived in family groups. And they exhibit what's called phylopatry. So the, um, it's a female matrilineal. And the, the girls stick around, and the boys leave and have to find new places. And that may explain a little bit about dogs, males versus females. The, the females tend to be more homebodies in general, not every single breed. And the, the boys can roam. You know, they, they, if there is one of the two that will roam, it tends to be the boys. Okay, so just in summary, so they uh, hunt in packs, they live in family groups. The female is the supreme leader. And I have got to say, I just want to make a point about this. There's advantage. I mean, finally, there is like a career that there's an advantage to be a female. And I don't know how you guys are, but I'm, I have talked to many, many people over my life about their dogs. And I have had people tell me, oh, my dog doesn't like tall men, short men, men with beards, men with hats, big, you know, deep voices, blah, blah, blah. I've never had someone tell me my dog doesn't like women, ever. I've never had that. And so, you know, someone may surprise me, but it's pretty unusual. And so, like I said, daughters tend to stay, sons disperse, and I do find that in, in dogs, whereas the females tend to be kind of homebodies, and, and the boys will roam if anybody's going to roam. So, David Meech, in his 1999 article said about his 1970 book, his book was the single greatest impact on the misunderstanding of wolf biology. And it's because of all this reliance on captive research. So you got to think about this. There's a whole um, philosophy of dog training that's based on the pack mentality and the alpha male and all that kind of stuff. That is still stuck around in dog training, even though this was published in 1999, 18 years ago. So it's still part of that whole scene. Okay, I just want to bring up a couple, uh, several other differences between 
dogs and wolves, so they are related, but they are quite different from one another. Okay? And so you can't always think that, oh, it's a wolf or a dog and we just treat them the same. For instance, I do want to point this out. This is an interesting change over time between wolves and dogs. When wolves, so it's really important when they're puppies, if you want them to interact with humans, they have to be socialized at some very critical time period. And with wolves, it's at two weeks old. They still don't have open eyes. Okay, they're still in a very protective state, and when they're two weeks old, they're not leaving mommy. Okay? And their time period, which they need to be exposed to humans to have any uh, friendliness to them, is two to six weeks old. Usually you don't get a puppy until they're eight weeks old, so two to six weeks, those little um, pups of wolves are with mom. And so that's why, one of the reasons why they're not often human oriented. Whereas dogs, they start becoming social at about three or four weeks old. Their eyes are already open and they can see things and they have a much longer period of time, up to 12 weeks that you have available to you to be able to socialize them, introduce them to every cat, dog, you know, person, thing that you want to. It's a really magic period of time. And if you can capture your dog during that period, it's really important. Some other things, though, eye contact. If you look at a dog's eyes, it's very loving for the most part. A wolf, that'd be a threat. Uh, if you're an injured person, a, caring, a dog is typically caring. A wolf may look at, be predatory towards an injured human. Okay? They don't look at them as a friend. It's not a wise idea if you see a wolf to go running away from it or towards it because they will look at that as a threat, whereas a dog will look at that as something playful. And um, let's see, oh, down here. Even after that socialization period, wolves still sh show a lot of uh, stranger anxiety, whereas dogs tend not to. Okay, so those are just some uh, clear biological differences between dogs and wolves. Okay, so now we're leaving wolves, but we're going to continue on this biology track and talk about dog communication and how we communicate with them. And so this research, and so I put down, I, I just put here like one of their books, but they have lots of research articles and stuff like that. But so Brian Hare, you guys may know him. He's at Duke University, um, Center of Cognitive Neuroscience. And he's an evolutionary anthropologist. And he uh, proposed that dogs actually self-domesticated. There were always these ideas that a person went and grabbed a wolf pup and then they raised them and stuff like that. But now the idea is that it was probably the dogs doing the bidding and they would be hanging around where the food is and stuff and getting closer and closer. And so they were probably rummaging for food, Select, there was selection for more human tolerance, and instead of survival of the fittest, survival of the friendliest. The more friendly a dog was, the more successful they are. And so that just tells you under natural evolutionary conditions, friend, dogs should be friendly. Okay? Dogs are not meant to be unfriendly to humans. That just doesn't make sense evolutionarily. That would be a total switch for them. So if a dog is, so for instance as a trainer, if a dog is unfriendly to humans, I know that there's something causing that and it can be changed because naturally dogs should be friendly. Okay, dogs learn via inferences. They make, they're able to make connections with things in regards to humans in particular. So they did a study where they had dogs, chimps, and bonobos, and bonobos are really small apes that are even more closely related, or equally closely related to us as chimps are. And the dogs were the ones that were superior in being able to do this type of test where they put food underneath one of these things or something that they wanted, and the human would actually point to the right one. The dogs would respond to that. The chimps and the bonobos would not pay attention to what the humans were doing with them. So there was a really strong connection between the dogs 
following the directions, the lead of the uh, humans, which really puts a lot of emphasis, at least for me, on hand signals. Hand signals are really great to work with dogs. They're a you're able to point to things, uh, tell them different things to do. They can figure out simple puzzles that way with your help. Okay, um, so dogs do follow human directions like hand signals pointing. They will mimic humans, what they're doing. Chimps don't do it, bonobos don't do it. So there's this really um, strong dog-human co-evolution. And it's very strong mutualism. We both get so much out of the relationship. There's other co-evolutionary relationships where you know, one gets a lot of benefit and the other one doesn't so much or they don't get really that much. But this is just so strongly mutual. There's unique communication between two totally different species. That's a really important point that these are humans and dogs have evolved this amazing communication ability with one another. It's very unique and you won't find, if you just think about all the other organisms, even with what humans relate to, there's nothing as strong as what you have with dogs. Okay, so dogs, similar to humans, they are influenced physiologically by mirror neurons. Mirror neurons allow you to copy things and hormones, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, the dog-human partnership is all based on guidance and, a, and being partners or companions. And dog training applications, the importance of hand signals, being able to use those, training in groups, I personally find working with three or four dogs at one time is easier than a single dog, especially if one of them's highly trained and then everybody kind of follows. I mean, it's really fun to do that. They do a lot of mimicking. Okay, so this was uh, the research that uh, Brian Hare published. I have to say, though, that before 1999, trainers in general who did obedience, field work, sheep herding, tracking, service work, therapy work, these military dogs, sniffing dogs, medical dogs, they all knew that you can point to things or do things and dogs would respond. But it was just so nice now to have supporting evidence that, yes, they really are superior even to chimpanzees, our closest relatives. Okay, so in uh, Brian Hare's book, he suggests that dogs use humans almost as tools, okay? However, I don't agree with that conclusion. I actually feel that dogs cooperate with humans and instead of using them as tools, they look at us as teachers, partners, their best friends. We are the brains of the partnership and they just provide the magic. There's so much that they provide that is amazing. Co-evolutionary relationships are a two-way street and really it comes down to not that they're using us as tools, but there truly is a dog-human love affair. And you may feel it with your dogs, you know, and you think, well, you know, why are you saying something like that? But there's now neurobiology evidence showing how much dogs love us. So that's the next study. So we're going to talk a little bit, I'm going to talk about uh, research in dog neurobiology. And Gregory Burns, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him, he's in Atlanta at Emory University. He's a neuroscientist. And he trained dogs to go into MRIs, uh, the machines, and get scans. So he can look at how the dog's brain is working, how they process human speech. These MRIs are great because they give you a snapshot of their brains. And the dogs weren't restrained at all. They weren't under any type of stress. They actually taught these dogs. I mean, dogs are just so amazing. Here they're in an MRI machine. And if you've ever been around an MRI machine, those things are not quiet. But this do these dogs learn to just rest their head and hang out and they're able to do these scans. Of course, you see a number of them are border collies. 
easiest dogs to train. <laughs> so one of the things that they found from these MRI machines, so for the longest time, like 10 years ago, oh, do dogs have feelings? Oh, do other animals other than humans have feelings? Well, through these MRI studies, yes, they do. They have shown it. So dogs and humans have the same uh, neural networks in their brains, which indicates that they feel similar feelings. And there's this part of the brain called the caudate nucleus, and I won't get into too much um, detail about it, but this, this caudate nucleus, it's in the inner central part of your brain, and it's part of what's called the primitive brain stem. It's common in all mammals, and it's the place where there is pleasure, sensation of pleasure with dopamine receptors. And remember, dogs work on the pleasure principle, and so it's the part where you see reward and anticipation, and it's involved in learning. And so dogs and humans, their brains are anatomically similar in structure with regards to the caudate nucleus, and they have a similar physiological response indicating that dogs show these same basic emotions, love, fear, sadness, happiness, and joy from these MRI studies. Okay, the importance of eye contact. Dogs look directly at humans. Most dogs do. I know sometimes dogs when they're really shy and stuff, but you can change all that. And this comes down to uh, oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone. It's the cuddle hormone. The cuddle hormone, the love hormone, it's actually a stress hormone, but it works in your body differently than cortisol. Even though it's a stress hormone, it makes like your blood vessels relaxed. And it's just a very, I mean, it's arousal, but still everything's relaxed. So it decreases anxiety. Dogs have happened to hijack this human or this bonding ability of humans. So when humans love humans, they are secreting oxytocin, they love one another. Well, actually dogs love humans even more. They've looked at their brains and they secrete, when they're looking at their human, they're secreting at least 10 times as much oxytocin as when you're looking at your lover. I mean, that's how much they love us. It's amazing. Okay. And so, and there's a feedback look. The longer you gaze at that dog, the more and more oxytocin is being secreted. I mean, they're just in love, like gazing into a lover's eyes. So there's this really special dog-human bond, very similar to the bond that humans have with their babies. And I just think that they have, uh, oops, oh, I, I didn't mean to do that, I'm sorry. It just goes really quickly if I hit something. There you go. So the dog human love affair. Okay, so when you're talking about wolves, remember I said you don't look directly in their eyes. Okay, that is threatening. It's a form of hostility. And wolves don't bond with humans. When they're looking at the human, they do not secrete oxytocin. Okay, so it's not, it, it would be more of like epinephrine and norepinephrine. Arr, let's get them. <laughs> So um, Gregory Burns, he's the guy up at uh, Emory, he did a follow-up on his research. He does all those MRIs, and the title of the book is What It's Like to Be a Dog. So he continued these studies to increase the sample size, because it does take him a while, because he has to train the dog to be very quiet in those MRI machines. But what he's seeing is that there's a high variation between the dogs in how much they secrete oxytocin, all these other variables, indicating that they have individual personalities. This has been known by dog people. I mean, how many here think, thought that your first dog that you had and the dog that you have now, exactly the same personality? No, they all have very different personalities. Well, we've always known this. However, now it's, again, nice to have scientific evidence because there are some training protocols that assume that there's no variation in dogs. Their personalities are the same, and I'll explain that. Okay, now we get to, and this is where this video is going to come in, Spencer. So um, now I'm going to talk about communication and play behavior. And this is really not the way that dogs play, right? 
I don't think anybody does. It's more like this, a lot of teeth involved and wrestling and all that kind of stuff. And if you haven't seen dog playing before, um, so I have a slide. I'm going to show you, a, it's a two and a half minute video that we put together. So this is the one I have to use. Okay, there was like a little bit of problem. Oh yeah, yeah, and then. Oh good, hang on. Okay, so how do we get there? So that dog at the end actually is um, probably one of the calmest dogs you'll ever meet. And uh, she's the dog that I work with whenever I have an aggressive dog, because she is just the calmest dog you'd ever meet. But she does play too, but that day she just wanted to chew a bone, or it's chew a stick. Okay, thank you so much for that help. Okay, so the way dogs play is different than the way that humans play with one another. They chase, they tackle, they wrestle, they bite. Well, let me put that back. I mean, there are boys that do that a lot, <laughs> you know, the young kids. But anyway, they chase, tackle, wrestle, bite. There's lots of teeth interactions. They're constantly using their teeth. They're oftentimes biting the lower part of their neck. They do bite each other's faces, but it's not dangerous. I mean, and that dog at the end, I, I wanted her in there. If there was something bad going on, that it was aggressive, she wouldn't put up with that, I'll tell you that. She wouldn't just be lying there chewing a stick. And so she'd tell me, she, it, it would upset her. But so, when they're playing like that, it's all fun. And, but the way dogs play is different than humans, and so sometimes, you know, what we may think is inhumane, you know, some of these behaviors, like, uh, for instance, this is an example I use, is that if we were living in a dog society, if I knocked on someone's door and, I open, and they opened the door, what do, how do dogs meet one another? <laughs> they sniff each other's butts, you know? But so if we said to everybody, okay, when I come over, you're gonna have to sniff my butt, you'd be like, oh my God, that is so gross. But that's how dogs are, you know? We just have to kind of accept dogs for dogs and understand that, okay? I'm just putting this in real quick because um, they are what they eat, nutrition's really important, and they are carnivores. I actually know someone who's raising their dog as a vegan, which is just like, you can't do that. But they're actually omnivorous uh, 
omnivorous carnivores, they can eat other stuff, but they do have to have a meat base, whereas cats are obligate carnivores. They must have meat and, you know, they're pretty uh, regulated on what they need, but dogs can eat all kinds of stuff. Okay, this gets to my third objective, how this research then applies to dog training and some of the dog training philosophies out there. Okay, so first of all, there's a toolbox that different trainers can use, they have access to, and it includes things like leashes, collars, harnesses, halters, muzzles, clickers and whistles, food rewards, pet praise, and love. All of those are different tools that you can use. And I divide the training philosophies into, well, really what you have out there fall into two main categories, the wolf's perspective, and the human's perspective. And then at the end, what I'm gonna explain is how I do it a little bit differently based on science, uh, but not science-based, because I'm not certain that's the right word to use, but how it's more based on biology and things like that. So, let me, why is it not, oh, there. Okay, so the first one, the wolf's perspective. Wolf and uh, dog's clothing and aversive training. So some assumptions of the wolf's perspective. Dogs are domesticated wolves. Wolves and dogs are pack animals. There's competitive hierarchies of a pack. Dominant, alpha male, subordinate, submissive individuals. You must dominate and control your dogs. What I've just talked about, you've seen that most of these things are false assumptions, okay? So the training toolbox, these tend to be what are called, and I don't call them that, but uh, they're the aversive trainers, that's what other people call them. High reliance on e-collars, they're the ones that really talk about punishments, you must punish your dogs, um, and sometimes really harsh physical corrections. Minimal verbal communication. Actually, I've been told by some trainers that we talk too much to our dogs, so they really don't like to use uh, communication. And minimal praise is what I've noticed. Dominance and controlling. And I was talking with some folks. I didn't really know that, you know, like these whispers, the dog whisper, whenever there's like the whisper involved there. There's some harsh treatment as an underlying assumption, which I didn't know that. But um, so in the past, people would ask me, so are you a dog whisperer? Absolutely not now that I know that that means that you have some harsh treatment involved. Okay, uh, the general approach. Initially, they do a good job. They consider you have to look at the animal. A dog is an animal, then a mammal, then a canine in the canine family and then there are the dog species, and then you have to think about the breed, you know, it's a border collie versus a retriever versus a St. Bernard. Um, but then when they get down to the individual, this is the one, this is the category that assumes dogs don't have personalities. So there's like a one-size-fits-all training, and oftentimes that one-size-fits-all is an e-collar. And there's so much variation, I and mean, we already looked at it. They have a ton of personalities. And so that type of just assuming, okay, you know, and, and so I'm aware that people will send their dogs to these places and they come back with an e-collar and a remote, and now you have to learn how to deal with your dog, and it's almost like it's a robot. Okay, so the fallacy for me is that they don't have personalities. And the first time I heard this, and I've heard it from others, was Caesar Milan. So when I first started training, I, I have read and watched everybody's stuff. You know, the, the Wolf's Perspective, Caesar Milan, all the positive trainers. I wanted to see what was out there. And he said, I was watching this video, and he said, yeah, dogs don't have personalities. And my clients, when I tell them that, they're always disappointed. And I'm like, how do they even listen to you? I mean, I don't understand that. But, you know, sometimes when they have this, like, reputation and they tell you something and you go, oh, yes, that's right, you know. But you should question those kind of things. But anyway, dogs do have personalities. It's not supported by the data. 
it's not support supported by owners. And so there isn't a one-size-fit-all training. It's not practical, logical, and it's really ineffective. Okay, so in summary, the wolf's perspective, they tend to dominate. They have this idea that we must be the alpha in, uh, individual. We must conquer them or they will conquer us. They have a pretty limited toolbox in that they do a lot of physical corrections, punishment, not very much uh, affection which and talking to your dog. And talking to your dog is actually not, you know, hey, honey, how's your day, that type of talking, but actually giving them verbal cues. They fight aggression with aggression, okay, who's going to be stronger. And they are viewed as the aversive trainers. Okay, so that's one category, and like I said, Caesar Milan fits into that category. And then there's this other category, the human's perspective is what I call them. And a lot of times they're treated as, as four-legged fur babies, and in this category they rely only on positive reinforcement. So here are some of the assumptions. Dogs are furry humans. They do live in family groups, which makes sense. Dogs learn to make correct choices. They understand the difference between right and wrong because they remember way from the past. That is not something that dogs do. They don't remember the past. They don't dwell on the future. They totally live in the present. Everything that we try to do in meditation and yoga, dogs already do it. Okay? They only focus on positive reinforcement that encourages good behavior. However, that leaves you pretty limited on what you do when they're doing bad behaviors. Okay? You've got to get rid of the bad behaviors before you can encourage good behaviors. They'll put dogs on timeouts to discourage behavior, and they're thinking that the dog is able to think about it. I'm going to put them on a timeout, and now I'm, they're not with mom, and they're going to be sitting there thinking, mm, what did I do? How can I get mom's attention back? They're smelling the greatest smell back there, so then they're not thinking any way like that. So, All right, so um, the training techniques. No e-collars, no training collars, no corrections, harnesses of all types. If you Google uh, harnesses and no-pull harnesses the, and images, the array of harnesses that you will see will be just breathtaking. Um, they train with flat collars, gentle leaders or halters, clickers. They use praise, tethering, food, food, and more food. Okay, lots of food. Okay, the limitations with this approach is that they're only using one-fourth of operant conditioning. Okay, they're only using one-fourth. The other thing that is a problem is that they don't let dogs make mistakes. It's really important to learn from mistakes. When we're in school, I was teaching, and if someone got a 95 on a test, I wouldn't say, hey, that was really great. Let's celebrate all those 95 cent, you know, answers that you got right. I would say, hey, or it would be me. I'd be like, which ones did I get wrong? And how do I correct that? But a teacher, they have a choice of saying, you are really stupid. I can't believe you got these five questions wrong. Or they can say, hey, let's learn you know, what you did, and we can move on from there kind of thing. You know, it's just how you approach it. But learning from your mistakes is the best way to learn. It's just you know, such an easy thing. Um, there's no learning in timeouts. If the human needs a timeout, that's absolutely correct. Put your dog on a timeout, put him in the crate or something, and cool down, because I know people get frustrated, and dogs can smell it. But the dogs aren't learning during those timeouts. Unfortunately, there's a really high reliance on food. And that doesn't, I mean, one, what do you do if your, food, your dog is not food motivated? There are dogs that are not food motivated. You know? And then the harnesses. The harnesses can be physically damaging to the dogs. There are front attachment harnesses that pull these front joints together, and vets are seeing a, a inhibited gait on dogs. And these harnesses are not friendly to humans. If you have a 150 or even a 60-pound dog on a harness and they're pulling, you know, they see their buddy across the street, they will probably pull you because their weight, their center of gravity and having four feet, 
uh, they can really pull someone down. So here's that operant conditioning uh, that I wanted to remind you of. Oops, wait, did I go the right way? Yes. Uh, so in summary, uh, oh, the reason I showed that, sorry. So with the human's perspective, they pretty much rely on this right here. That's all they use, positive reinforcement. They do a little bit of negative punishment, and that's the timeouts, but everything that they do is right here, okay? So it's kind of hard to, you know, stop bad behaviors if all you're doing is waiting for good behaviors, okay? And so sometimes they need a little bit of direction. Okay, so in summary, the human's perspective, only positive reinforcement, they encourage with food and praise, really no physical corrections, but they do tethering, minimal punishments, rely on halters and harnesses. They're viewed as the positive trainers, and this is, these are the science-based training. When I started understanding this, that science-based training is positive training only, I realized that I had to change the title of my talk because I'm a science person, and uh, anyway, I'll explain. So the dog's perspective, and this is what I propose. Dogs are in dog fur, and you use gentle touch training. Okay, so I assume, the dog's perspective assumes dogs are dogs, they live in family groups, they're just like, you know, furry little toddlers, but they're not humans, okay? Dogs are zen and are always in the id. They live in the present, they do not think about the past or fret about the future, follow the pleasure principle, it's all about I want, I want, I want. We are partners with dogs and, you know, really recognize our co-evolutionary success. The dog's perspective has a very diverse training toolbox and you use appropriate gear for the task. Training collars for obedience, and I'll explain what I'm talking about there. Communicate and play behavior. Always use positive voice and actions. Train in realistic conditions, like you know, at your house or whatever. And I use what's called positive discipline, and I use gentle touch training techniques. What's positive discipline? Oh, um, I'll get to that next. Uh, so, gentle touch training techniques. These are 100% mutual respect. And actually, in the dog training world, using that word respect is a, you know, people just really get upset about that one, too. <laughs> anyway, so dogs need to have gentle mouths. They should never nip, they should never mouth, they should always be calm, they should be totally uh, respectful of your hands. And at the same way, humans should always have gentle hands on the dogs. No hitting, nothing harsh, lots and lots of petting and physical praise. And then also what I call a, a, the training collar, a low training collar that simulates uh, play behavior. And I will explain that. But what I want to explain is positive discipline. And this is used with human children since the 1920s. Uh, in uh, Europe, but it got popular here in the States in 1981. It's used in schools and parenting kids. The idea is that there are no bad children, just good and bad behaviors, and you definitely need to encourage the good behaviors, but you cannot ignore the bad behaviors because those will just cause problems. You use calm, friendly, and respectful approaches, and they use all four quadrants of positive of operant conditioning. So for example, in a human example, positive reinforcement, you compliment, good job. You know, they did something, they put effort into it, great job. Negative reinforcement, ignoring whiny requests. You know, oh mom, I have to go, or whatever. Um, cleaning positive punishment, they have to clean up their mess, okay? Or negative punishment, they get grounded. Okay, so these are techniques that humans use. However, those don't really fit for dogs. You know, if they make a mess, you're going to be hard pressed to say, hey, doggy, go pick up that mess. Okay? Or if they're whining, they're probably whining at the door and you better respond to them because maybe they're asking to go out. So dogs and 
you know, kids, we have to do it differently. So you have to apply these training techniques that are, you know, having to do with real stuff with dogs. And remember, they are always in the id, no ego, no reasoning. They can't be practical about this stuff. So here's this operant conditioning thing again. And this is where um, I can explain, for instance, with reinforcements. Say they're doing good things, like they're not pulling, or they're not jumping, or they come when called. That's great. And so when they come, you give them a treat. Yeah, that was awesome. But you then have to correct bad behaviors. What if they are pulling or jumping or biting or barking or digging or going to eat? Um, what do you call that stuff um, that's really, really uh, toxic? Uh, antifreeze? You know, you got to, or chasing cars. There are some really significant things that, you know, you don't just have a cookie and say, oh, here, little dog, get a cookie instead of chasing the car. That's not going to work, okay? So you have to have different approaches. But what we have to do is we have to think outside the Skinner box because when Skinner did this, first of all, it was rats and pigeons in a little container, and there are only two choices, food or electric shock and that's it. And then all of dog training is based on this or science-based dog training. So definitely have to think outside the box. So choosing the right gear for the task, and I already mentioned these different, these are just like the variety of uh, tools that you can have. And in the dog's perspective, we consider all the equipment except for three things and I'll explain why, and then there's a very special case that I want to talk about. So the things that uh, I don't use, halters, chokers, and slip leads. So what are those? Oops, um, I guess I have to do this first. I'm going to do this first before I get to that. So, oh yeah, because this gives you some background of why I don't use halters. So this is the dog's nose. Okay, and this is their brain, and you can see that most of their brain has to do with sniffing and what they're going to smell. Their, their bodies are ruled by their nose. And here's a human's brain, here's a dog's brain. Human's brain, much, much bigger than the dog's brain. And you can see how big the olfactory lobe of the human, of the dog's is versus the human's. Okay, and olfactory is for smelling. Dogs have over 30 million olfactory receptors. Humans have 6 million. We have no concept of the world of the dog's nose. You know, dogs can smell cancer. They can smell drugs in a suitcase. They can smell bombs. It's amazing what they can do with their noses. Okay? And so here's the olfactory bulb. And, uh, of, and the track right here of a dog's brain. And then I want to show you this real quick. So there are these really cool features inside the dog's nose and this particular thing it's called the olfactory epithelium and it creates this little catacomb right here that's really important for smelling. There's also this ancient uh, vomer nasal organ right here and then here's where the olfactory bulb is. But you see right here, this is at the bridge of the nose, and when a dog is wearing a gentle leader, it's right over that. And the idea is to tighten that thing, and I don't recommend anybody putting anything on a dog's nose. This is my dog, and when I put this on her, actually, she's usually a very happy dog. When I put this on her, she had like the saddest expression. It was just the funniest thing. I don't use these, but it was just like, what are you doing to me? But it's because of that fragile and very critical part of the dog's nose. And that's not bone. That's epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is just like your skin. So it's very, very fragile. And so that's the reason why I don't recommend people using a halter. 
And you know, just the same with you. Do you want someone to like hold your head and do that kind of stuff to you? I mean, it's really kind of rude to grab the dog's head as opposed to teaching them to look at you, you know? All right, so that's the uh, gentle leader or the halter. And then this is the choker and slip lead. And it has that, you know, basically it's like a noose. And these, I don't recommend these at all. Uh, they, they literally choke the dog. And when, way, way, way back when, when I was at the zoo, this is what they were using. And I had a personal freak accident and it was the last day I ever used one of these. So you see these little rings? Well, they're usually welded closed and it, the welding was breaking and I gave a correction to my dog and it's hooked. It, it hooked into like a really small thing around her neck and I freaked out. I was with someone and we got it off of her and I never put it on a dog again. And so I really think those are really dangerous. Same with these. If they run this way and you're holding it, all they're going to do is just tighten on their neck and it chokes them. So anyway, here's a special case. This is the prong collar or the pinch collar. And it looks barbaric. It looks, it, it gets the worst wrap in the world, but it really is an awesome training tool if you use it right. And I'll explain how you use it. So when dogs are playing, they chase one another, okay? Chasing can be part of a training t uh, program, but dogs should always chase the human only. Never ever chase your dog. Then you're just chasing, teaching them to run away from you. Tackling and wrestling is another thing that dogs like to do with one another. And we can simulate that with petting and hugging and loving and, you know, they just love that stuff. Then there's that whole biting thing that they do. That's where that training collar comes in. The prongs actually resemble teeth and you use it to communicate with your dog just as if they're the teeth of you on your dog's neck and you use what's called gentle touch training. There's never these major corrections. It's really light, almost like a puppet. And if you put it on their neck, so you have to be really careful. High on a the neck, their trachea is right here. Let me show you a different picture before I get into that. So here's a dog's uh, physio or anatomy. High on the neck, their carotid is right here, jugular their um, nerves, everything right here is so sensitive and exposed. It's not covered up by muscles. Low on the neck, there are these very strong back and neck muscles. And this is where most of the time when dogs are playing with one another, that's where they're biting each other is really low on the neck. They bite in the face too, but you never see them bite here because this is a kill area. It's really exposed. If they were going to kill an animal, they'd go for this. That's a kill bite. Down here is play. And so I want to show you a few pictures of what, so that's um, the basic dog anatomy. And then here you can see this is the esophagus and the trachea. And there's a thin line right here kind of showing where the body is. All of this is exposed. There's no muscle right there. Whereas on the neck and the back, they have a lot of muscles. And so here's a better one. So if you put the collar low, which I recommend people doing, then it's right over muscles, right where they're playing. If you stick it right under here, you are going to hurt your dog. So I think it's, um, you have to be really careful. Again, you can put it down here, but not up here. There's no muscles protecting the throat of the dog. And that's why people get upset about it. And I don't blame them because when you go on the internet, this is what you're going to see. It says right here, uh, I have to read it. It says collar should be, should sit here. This is, so it says collar should be here. This is too low. I do the complete opposite. I put it low because that's more of a play area. And this is just too dangerous. That's not safe. But everything that you see on the internet says to put it this way, okay? Whereas I recommend it 
the opposite way. So, and again, this is my dog cognac, and this isn't even as high as they put it, but I just couldn't do it. I've never done that before. But so they want it really high on their neck, as opposed to right down here. And when you put it right down here, you barely need any corrections. It works so well. And they actually like it. <laughs> okay, so word of caution, you do need a knowledgeable trainer that knows what they're doing. Aversive trainers place it really high on the neck, the sensitive part, oh, that should say part, of the neck. And I personally think it's torturous and punishing. Uh, any internet resources will say to put it high on the neck. Even the Humane Society of America says to put it high on the neck if you have to use it. However, if you use it low on the neck, it's non-aggressive. You couple that with food or praise, it simulates play behavior. It provides guidance and direction, and I believe if it's used properly, it should be classified as a positive reinforcement, not a negative reinforcement, because it resembles play behavior. So training collar is a form of positive reinforcement when it's low on the neck. I wasn't the first person to say this. Actually, there was this um, vet, Hans uh, Tusudi. He wrote a book called The Companion Dog Training, and he said that the training collar, the prong collar, was well thought out, cruelty-preventing device, and he thought that the chokers were like one of the worst things. Even though it looks innocuous, those are dangerous, and the prong collars are much nicer. Sometime between 1942 and I don't know when, someone said to put it really high, and it's stuck that way, and everybody puts it that way. And I don't uh, recommend doing that. Okay. The training collar is really good to get quick results. Why are quick results important? I recently watched the video about puppies and puppy biting, and this person was saying, it's gonna take three or four months for your puppy to stop biting using this technique. And I'm thinking, what? Three or four months? Holy cow, I really, I mean, if you have a puppy biting, you gotta kinda stop them right away. I'm not saying to use a collar like this, but it's really important to get quick results because dogs don't live that long, you're going to get frustrated, and they get older and, you know, worse behaviors happen. So when you're using a training collar the way I describe it, pulling on leash almost stops immediately, okay? And it does simulate dog play behavior, so they actually are really pretty happy. They don't mind it at all. And I get feedback from clients saying it works great, and I get feedback from the dogs. They're happy, their tails are wagging, they're very, very, I mean, I just have never had any problems. Okay, and then finally, so this is what happens when uh, you don't wanna use some of these other tools. This poor dog, they're trying to figure out some way that this harness can keep them from pulling and this looks cruel to me, you know, and it's probably hurting them physically. And when you have a large dog like that and they see something and they're on a harness and they want to get it, they're taking you with them, you know. You don't have a choice, okay. And that's just a matter of physics. Even if this dog is 60 pounds and you're 150 pounds, they can drag you down the street and those are going to cause injuries for everybody. Okay, so when you're looking at dog training, okay, I'm going to have to read off here. I didn't uh, put my glasses. But so all of this stuff, positive reinforcement, um, you know, food, treats, things like that. But down here, negative reinforcement, I'm going to come over here, saying no to your dog. Say your dog is going to jump off a cliff and you say, Fido, no, you've just punished your dog because you stop them from doing something. That's called stopping a behavior and that's called a punishment. Even though you're saving their lives, okay, it's considered a punishment. Um, when you're house training and you remove rugs or you remove furniture or you put them in a crate, that's considered a punishment. Even though dogs should be crated, it's a really good thing for them to learn. It helps with potty training, things like that. Okay, so in summary, the dog's perspective. 
I use positive discipline for dogs, all four quadrants, modified for dogs, but you're always calm, friendly, and respectful to the dog. You use gentle touch, tra uh, gentle touch training. There are no harsh phys physical corrections, but you establish boundaries, just like little kids. You establish boundaries and they thrive as long as they know their boundaries. And you use rewards and loving praise and food, but really, dogs really love to be petted. I mean, it's just like, yes, let's do that. And if they don't like to be petted, they need to learn how to like to be petted because that will change their lives, okay? Now, there are challenging pups that have uh, behavioral issues. It could be that they were born that way or it could be that they were in a bad situation and they need love and guidance, okay? What you need to do in these cases, you need to consider all the available resources and how you're going to deal with these issues. You gotta weigh the pros and cons. And if you need corrections, using positive discipline and letting them learn from their mistakes, but doing it in a nice way and not a mean way. So I'm gonna give you two examples of problem child, problem children is what I call them. And just how you have to think outside the Skinner box. So this is Luca, this big guy right here. And this is, these are my dogs and they're about 60 pounds. So you can see his size, he's 150 pounds. He's a big guy. So I met him when he was a year and a half old and he was already 150 pounds. He was aggressive to humans and dogs, 150 pounds. And he injured his owner because of a, because of a harness and he bit a stranger, dragged her right there, okay? Used previous training techniques, okay? Uh, positive training. Unfortunately, they gave up on the client. And these were the recommendations. Either your dog to, is to remain home and confined, or you might need to put your dog down. Those were the two choices. So they gave me a call and figured, so first of all, I sat up on a counter for my first two sessions because he wanted to bite me. <laughs> and then I used a muzzle, which calmed him down, and I was able to touch him by the third uh, lesson, and he loves me. I mean, I can like do anything to him now. We had to use an e-collar for barking. He doesn't pull anymore. We use the training collar. And when I first met them, okay, gentle touch, that one of the first things they said to me is, he doesn't like his head petted. And I said, guess what he needs to do? He needs to love getting his head petted. And now he's a very affectionate dog. He loves it. Okay, that's like the first thing you do. And then I also use, this is her, his buddy. This is Cognac. That, this is the one that was chewing the bone while the little puppies were playing. And she's a really calming influence for him. And he will imitate, mimic some of her stuff when they're in uh, stressful situations. Oh, I wanted to go back. And this was a cool day because, um, so she always works with him. But this was the first day that he met her. And this is my dog. And I mean, they were great, whereas before, you know, we were afraid that he was going to kill other dogs. And then here's another dog that really taught me a lot of lessons. Her name is Kismet, and she's a 10-year-old deaf shepherd. And a person got her within the last year from a local shelter. And the question is, how do you communicate with a dog that can't hear you? I mean, she's totally stone deaf. So you can use her eyes, hand signals. That's a really great thing. But the problem is, what if she's not looking at you? If she's across the hall, across the room, you know, you can't, I guess you can jump up and down. She might feel the vibrations on the floor. But you have to be like, wow, what am I going to do? And so what I used is a vibration collar. It's very similar to a uh, e-collar, except how many here have a, a telephone, a, a cell phone, and if you put it on vibrate, that's exactly what they're feeling. So say your phone's on vibrate and you're doing something, and it doesn't hurt you, but it definitely makes you go, oh, what's that, you know, kind of thing. Like, oh. 
And that's exactly what it did for her. And so what we did is we would vibrate the collar and we taught her to look at the owner. And then she would do hand signals after that. But so it's thinking outside the box. It's like an e-collar, but it's a total vibration collar. Again, it's an example of you know, how you solve these problems when you know, there's not a quick fix. We're not exactly certain what to do. OK, so training deaf dogs. You use the appropriate gear. There's absolutely no sound, zero. So like I said, I used a vibration or pager collar. It's not an e-collar. It's like a cell phone. Plus, you use you know, your positive voice when she's looking at you in actions. She can't hear you, but she can see you. I spent a lot of time looking for how-to videos on these pagers, and they don't exist. But, uh, and maybe I'll make one. But so she's a great example of old 10-year-old dog definitely learn new tricks. And they can do it, and she did it really well. Oops, so I'm almost done. So here are the three training philosophies, uh, the wolf's perspective and the human's perspective. And I put them this way because the dog's perspective, what I propose, is pretty much in the middle. Okay? I utilize stuff that the wolf's perspective does, but I do it in a really nice way. And I definitely use positive reinforcement, but that's not the only show in town. Okay, there's a lot more. OK, so then finally, conclusions. So dogs are forever toddlers. And you need to think about the pleasure principle. I want, I want, I want. They're very distinct from wolves. They're the first domesticated species. The survival of the friendliest. Dogs should be friendly. If they're not, they're probably fearful. And that can be trained. Um, they follow directions, hand signals, and verbal cues. They fit into the human family as little kids. They show basic emotions. They have individual personalities. They are our co-evolutionary partners in life and love. Uh, they love us more, and that eye contact and petting releases that oxytocin. Dogs love to play. They play differently than human, and sometimes things that we think are inhumane are actually what I call dogmane. And it's great for dogs to learn from their mistakes, just like humans do, but you do it gently and with guidance and love. So dogs need to play every day. They love to play. And you need to, if you're training, make training fun. Make it play, okay? Learning it makes learning fun. It's natural and healthy. Um, Socialization training is great, especially when it's supervised. I did have a, tr a positive trainer one time. She got really upset with me. We were at this party, and I told her about the prong collar, and she started crying and left. I mean, it just made her so upset. But I was trying to explain this stuff, and I said, you know how dogs play? And she goes, oh, I don't let my dogs play. <laughs> and I said, what? So there are people that just don't let that happen. You know, you have to be at the card table. And so it's great for dogs to play. They should learn how to play. But some dogs are going to be bullies. And I work with dogs that way off leash with that vibration collar, actually. And it's really fabulous. OK, so what is science-based dog training? That is positive reinforcement only. And if that's true, I really, that's not what I do. So that's why I decided I changed this talk to science of dog training. Because dogs are dogs, and I train from the student's perspective. I'm a teacher, and it's the dog's perspective. So you have to think as if you're working from the id, and how a dog, you know, how would a dog respond, or how, what, what would a dog do? Um, dogs are unique and individual, so their personalities and past histories will really dictate how you solve their problems if they have problems. And having a complete toolbox just gives you all those opportunities. So I'm a dog training science teacher. I have a ton of experience teaching and research. And I do teach, I, I treat my students, humans, and uh, uh, dogs kindly. You know, I, I, just like I did in college, I treat them exactly the same way with kindness and love. 
So um, I am giving another talk in uh, the end of March. It's going to be at the Science Museum, and I'm actually getting a puppy. So I'm, this is one of my, uh, these are my kids, and this is one my puppy. Now he's 18 and she's 16. But um, I'm going to have a puppy at this one, and I'm going to have Cognac, that calm dog. So if you want to, uh, on March uh, 31st in the afternoon, we're going to be at the Science Museum. So, and there's my website. I'm on Instagram, Training Lucky Dogs, and on Facebook. And I did put out these things. If I don't have your email address, phone number, because I'll send you a free ebook, kind of a summary of this talk. So, thank you. I know I ran long. I'm sorry. Um, but if you have any questions, let me know.